All right, who dat? And we are back here on Inside Black and Gold, getting y'all ready for week eight. Saints heading back out to California to face off with the Chargers. Saints two and five, trying to get back on track. Chargers three and three. I'm still trying to figure out exactly what the Chargers are. And so that's why it's great. We have a guest coming in, David Drogemeyer, host of Locked on Chargers. I know he's hanging out with Ross Jackson earlier uh, earlier today talking about the Saints. So he's all, he's all geared up. David, how are you doing tonight? Doing very well. Uh, excited to talk about another contest and uh, another beautiful football game. Uh, you know, this is a game I think both teams really kind of need. You know, they need this win to get back on track, to get back in the win column, uh, to get the vibes flowing in a positive way. And I think injuries have been a big, big reason why both these teams have been scuffling a little bit. Um, but I think they're going to get a little bit healthier going into this game. And we'll see how much of an impact that that has on both these teams. Gotcha. You know, I think, you know, the the Chargers for a while, I kind of felt like I knew what they were uh, under Brandon Staley, under that whole regime. And and that's that's all changed. And you have Jim Harbaugh. I feel like there's a new kind of identity. It's a it's a run heavy scheme with Greg Roman. Right. Like what what have you seen this year with that new kind of approach and, and how has it gone so far? Well, I've seen growing pains. Uh, it's it's definitely a, a complete 180 from what this Chargers team has been in the past, which has been more of a finesse team, a team that's built from the outside in, you know, focusing more on their skill position players, their wide receivers, you know, their tight ends, running backs. That's more been more of their focus, um, mostly the, the outside wide receivers. And, you know, they wanted to win that way. And Jim Harbaugh doesn't play football that way. You know, he wants to dominate the line of scrimmage. He wants to uh, run the football. He wants to be physical. He wants to be tough. Um, but the thing is, Rome was not built in a day. And, and the way that he wants Rome to look is an ongoing process. You have to get the right players in place. Um, his coaching staff obviously is in place to help accelerate that. But you have to have the right personnel. Um, but I think it's still them trying to figure it out. Um, they're not all the way there yet. And I mean, this is just year one of a complete culture change, philosophy change, um, and, you know, change from just the top down. Uh, this is the first time in 25 years that the ownership has went out and actually spent the money to go get a legitimate winning head coach. So um, I think he's got plenty uh, of rope um, and plenty of time to be able to kind of make this in his image. He expects to ex to compete right away. So do the Chargers uh, and the organization. But um, with the understanding that there's going to be some growing pains to deal with um, while they try to get where they ultimately want to go. Yeah, and I think that's one of the benefits of going with a with a Jim Harbaugh, right? Like you you change coaches if you bring in a guy that no one really knows. You know, the the leash might be shorter, but you know when you bring in an established name, a guy who's won titles at least in college. You know, obviously he took the 49ers to the Super Bowl, but you know it, how has the kind of the fan base kind of reacted to to the Jim Harbaugh? Because he's kind of it's kind of a unique personality i don't know if he still wears the pleated pants but oh yeah you know, it's, a, it's it's a i don't know if it's an acquired taste is the word but it's definitely a a culture shock a little bit when you bring in a guy like that oh for sure jim harbaugh is completely enigmatic you know he is a, a completely different cat he definitely uh he is going off the beat of his own drum right uh he is completely authentically himself but the players love it because he has done it at every level as a player, he's done it in college, was fantastic in college as a player, was a high draft pick, then took that to the NFL, had a very, very long, successful career in the NFL, then became a coach and started at the very bottom as a coach and worked his way all the way up to the top. And so the players absolutely love him and respect him. And also, he's not the coach that's just sitting there and telling people what to do. He's going there and there's he's doing it himself. He's the one pulling the sleds. He's wearing the cleats on game day. He's, you know, jumping in the in the cold uh, cold tubs. He's doing all of those things uh, right alongside the team. So I know the team loves him. They have 100% buy-in and the fans have been clamoring for a legitimate real, you know, head coach that has some, you know, track record of success. Um, so they're all in. They love it. I mean, they're 100% in on Jim Harbaugh and who he is and also, you got to know every time that he gets in front of a microphone, you are liable to get a pretty awesome soundbite. Yeah, he strikes me as a he strikes me as a like hot tub in a t-shirt kind of guy. Oh yeah, uh, I don't know. 
<laughs> um, but you know, so okay, the, the Chargers and the Saints. One thing they have in common there's a lot of Q's on the on the depth chart, and you know, a lot of Q's and O's. Not not the letters you want to see. No. Uh, you know, particularly particularly at wide receiver, right? I'm looking at Quentin Johnson, questionable. Vlad McConkey, questionable. Will Disley, who you know has kind of been, I think he was the leading receiver against the Cardinals. He was. Hayden Hurst yeah. is is dealing with an injury. He got back to practice today, but obviously, obviously that's tough. DJ Chark, I think he's back from IR. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So I mean, what what has that passing attack looked like? Obviously, this is a run first team with J.K. Dobbins and and such. But who are the go to wide receivers? Because I just don't see anyone that you know. If you have, if like for example, Marshawn Lattimore, who is he going to cover? Right. Like, that's my question is, who's the number one? Yeah, right now. Uh, I mean, I, I think who who's going to make it to game day, I think, is the question uh, that we have to answer there. Uh, obviously, both of their probably number one, number two wide receivers up to this point is probably been Quentin Johnston and, and Lad McConkey. But uh, Quentin Johnston hurt his ankle in the last game. Um, he toughed it out. He played played hurt, uh, but he missed the last game um, against the Cardinals and it's not looking very good that he like he's going to be out there for this one. You miss a couple of days of practice, don't even practice in a limited capacity. It's not looking good. And then Lad McConkey played hurt in the last game, um, did everything he possibly could for uh, uh, against the Arizona Cardinals, but it's not looking good for him either. So uh, the one kind of saving grace, I guess, here is that DJ Chark looks like he's going to make his season debut um, this Sunday. And, you know, obviously DJ, DJ Chark's one of those guys, and the Chargers have a lot of them, they're kind of hoping that he bounces back, you know, that he has a, a new opportunity with another quarterback, an elite quarterback, um, and they need him. What he does well is stretch the field and go get the contested catch, you know, that ball over the shoulder. One thing we all know is Justin Herbert is one of the strongest arms in the NFL that has not really been uh, really exercised too much to this point. So hopefully when DJ Chark makes his debut, hopefully on Sunday, he's able to utilize that speed and stretch the field. Um, to open things up, hopefully for uh, you know returning Hayden Hurst as well uh, in the middle. But yeah, the Chargers have a lot of injuries. Uh, they're going to have to figure it out. Probably going to have some elevations with Jalen Rager. Uh, also expect you know if both those guys aren't able to play, that Brendan Rice, the son of Jerry Rice, will probably get on the field and, and get some opportunities as well. Sure, and you know you brought up Justin Herbert, so let's let's get into Justin Herbert. He's it's kind of a fascinating guy to me because like from day one. I feel like everyone's on the same page. Like this guy's a really good quarterback, right? Like he is a pro bowl caliber winning quarterback. It just never has happened for him yet. Right. Like you're in what year five, year six. I think he was in that same Joe Burrow to a draft. Right. Mm-hmm. So the, the COVID draft, the one where no one actually got to go. Correct. And so, you know, what it, it, is that kind of still the resounding idea of like, Hey, we just haven't built a team around him yet. Or what is kind of the vibe for Justin Herbert? And, and you kind of look at, yeah, you look at his roster and it's like, okay, well, who, 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 he's, do we expect him to throw for 5,000 yards with Simi Fahoko and some of these other guys? Like, uh, what, what, how do you kind of assess Justin and how his career has gone to this point in this season in particular with the new kind of regime? Well, I mean, an, another new regime for Justin Herbert, another right. offense to have, for him to have to learn. It, it's been four or five different offensive coordinators, four or five different offenses, no defense whatsoever to speak of up to this point. I mean, they're fantastic now, but in years past, they've been horrible, you know, and they were horrible. And so you had to ask Justin Herbert to be Superman and go throw for 450 yards and try to bail you out. And, you know, when you're giving up 37 points, uh, it's kind of hard to score 38. You know, it's, it's a lot to ask your quarterback to do. And of course, in the National Football League, it's all about wins and losses. Um, even though it's a team sport, the quarterbacks get paid the most. So they're the ones that accept all of the blame, responsibility, or they get to enjoy the, the triumphs of it as well. But uh, it's this has always been a situation to where Justin Herbert has had to carry way more weight than he ever should have had to. Haven't had really uh, any semblance of a consistent running game, and he hasn't had a very good defense up to this point. This year, it's, you know, hot and cold on the running game, a couple of good games, several really bad games, but the defense has been phenomenal. I mean, they are uh, the number one defense in the NFL by points per game allowed, um, but they're still trying to figure out who they are from an identity standpoint on offense. And, you know, dealing with, you know, a less than stellar cast of 
uh, guys to throw the football to. He's just trying to figure it out. But the game plan is always try to control the clock, try to run the ball, try to take off of Justin Herbert's plate and not ask him to go out there and be the guy to do everything. Um, but it just hasn't really matriculated in that way up to this point the way they want it to. Yeah, well, I, I do blame, you know, Brandon Staley refusing to take a tie for some of that, right? Like, you look at a guy, it's like, oh, he hasn't gotten to the playoffs. He hasn't won the playoffs. Well, they, they had a chance to yeah. take, a, take a tie. And the irony is you, you look at that and say, well, you know, if as the longer your career goes this way, the more in common you have with Derek Carr, who happens to be the other quarterback who they didn't take a tie against and went to the playoffs that season, lost to the Bengals. Um, you know, I think Bur I think Herbert's ceiling is higher than Derek Carr's ever was, but at the same time, that's where you end up. You don't have a defense. You don't. You know, you feel like there's excuses. There's valid excuses. There's reasonable sure. excuses. But at the end of the day, it's like, okay, where's the wins? Where's the playoff wins? Um, and that's that's got to be frustrating for for a fan base that does identify like, hey, we know we have the guy. Why can't we figure this out? Right? It's really annoying. Yeah, especially from outside perspective, because we watch Justin Herbert every single week and we know that Justin Herbert makes throws that other quarterbacks simply can't make. Right. And he makes plays and he escapes the pocket and he has defenders dra dragged all over him and he still escapes and is able to make plays. He does things no other quarterback can do. But if you don't get the wins, then you don't get the respect. That's just what it is in, in the NFL. No matter how talented you are, no matter how much stats you put up, it doesn't matter. Even in a, in a team game, uh, the quarterbacks, like I said, still are the focal point of the team. Whether it's their fault that you win or they lose, it doesn't matter. It's all about wins and losses, and that's why I hate the fact that everybody says wins are a quarterback stat. No, they're not. They're not at all. It's a team game. You win together, you lose together. And of course, nobody even has this argument if the Chargers and Justin Herbert beat the Jacksonville Jaguars like they should have, and he has a playoff win. Nobody's even having the same type of conversation up to this point. But, you know, the goalposts always get moved. They always get pushed back further and further and further. It's, oh, you want a playoff game? Okay, cool. Well, why haven't you got to the title game? Okay, all right, you got to the title game. Why haven't you won a Super Bowl? Like, it, it always gets moved back further and further and further. And so um, nobody cares unless you win a championship. Um, how many times does people remember the people who lose in the Super Bowl? Never. Nobody cares about the loser. It's all about the winner. It's all about what have you done for me lately. And unfortunately for Justin Herbert, it hasn't been enough winning. That's definitely fair. And, and, you know, you mentioned this earlier. It's like, hey, this is <laughs> – it's funny. You can never have the offense and the defense at the same time, right? Like it's never. always one or the other. The Saints have been doing that for years, right? Uh, and, you know, when you do have both, it's usually the year, hey, well, this is a Super Bowl team. But, you know, the, as you mentioned, the defense this year, the Chargers defense, I think part of that's complimentary, right? Like when you're, when you're, you know, leaning on a defense and you're trying to put them in good situations, you're forcing the other team to take long fields because you're not sure. necessarily going up and down the field. Those things kind of lead to each other. But this has been a top 10 defense in a lot of respects for the Chargers. So what have they excelled in to this point? You obviously have like familiar names, Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack, those guys. But, you know, what what is kind of their calling card to this point in the season? So their defense is very, very simple for them to execute, but very difficult for their opponent to see what they're doing. Um, and be able to understand what they're doing, what they're seeing, and believing what they're seeing. Because the Chargers and Jesse Minter, they use a lot of simulated pressures. that They want to show you one thing pre-snap and then change the picture post-snap to make you try to diagnose where the pressure is coming from, who's dropping into coverage, who's not. They want to make a quarterback think and have to process quickly, and that is a kryptonite for a rookie quarterback or yep. a quarterback that just doesn't have a lot of of snaps a lot of time on task so they want to fly to the ball they want to keep a roof over the coverage limit the explosive plays which they've done an excellent job of um and set up their pass rush you know they want to get into those third and long situations which they've done a very very good job of getting into and when you get into third and long against the chargers um it is a nightmare scenario because they are going to be sending khalil mack they're going to send Thule. Hopefully they get Joey Bosa back, who is uh, returned from practice. Um, he's been hurt so much. It, it's just been really frustrating because when he's on the field, he's an elite player. But that's the problem. He's never on the field. So hopefully he makes his way back because he definitely wants to be up for this game with Spencer Rattler uh, and Khalil Mack on one side, Joey on the other side, doing what they wanted to do when they took pay cuts 
to stay with the Chargers, which is play together and go eat, which they haven't really been able to do. So that's what I expect to see, uh, and uh, we'll see what it looks like on Sunday. When he's on the field, he's a Bosa, right? Right, exactly. Unfortunately, he's a Nosa most of the time. <laughs> Sorry, that was bad. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so, all right. So, uh, you know, one, one thing that, and we're kind of jumping around here, but one thing the Saints have done better than any other team in the NFL this year is make like the backup running backs backup look like all pro, right? Like a couple of weeks ago, it was like some guy named Sean Tucker. I've never even heard of before in my life. Uh, one off for 14 carries, 136 yards. Yeah, that was pretty uh, wild. Last week, I think uh, Audric Estime, you know, had a, had a really nice day. Like that, it, it's it's always amazing to me the depth players on rosters that seem to go off against the Saints. It it, it never fails. So you know, we all know about J.K. Dobbins, and 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 he's having a great year. Bouncing, and, you know, he's been a guy who's been hurt most of his career. Obviously, started with the Ravens, really kind of coming into his own this year. But I kind of feel like we know who that is, right? He's one of those big, strong, Big Ten running backs. Going to try to run through you. He's going to lean on you. But who is kind of the the player that you might not know going in for the Saints? That Saints fans are going to come out of this game being like, I hate that guy. <laughs> yeah. So I think the backup running back for the Chargers is, is Kaimani Vidal. Uh, he is a sixth round pick, you know, coming out of the Sun Belt Conference. Um, obviously, a very, very small college conference, but he dominated. He went absolutely insane there. And that's kind of what you're looking for when you're drafting running backs in the late rounds. You want guys, especially if they're from a smaller school, they want to look like the big fish in the small pond. You have to stick out. You have to be, you know, kind of be the man among boys. And he definitely was. He is a he was an NFL ready pass protector right away. Uh, he runs uh, like a, a little bowling ball. He's a small guy. He's kind of diminutive in st stature, but he has great vision, great contact balance. Uh, he's really able to stay on his feet and seems like he gets those extra few yards, even though he's a, a really, really small type of dude. I think he is a guy who, on his very first touch in the NFL, caught a wheel route for a touchdown uh, in his very, very first play suited up. And then I mentioned Brennan Rice earlier. Brennan Rice has had some trouble trying to get on the, the field. And I think, you know, the one time he really did get an opportunity to get in on the play against the Arizona Cardinals, there was a, some miscommunic miscommunication with some motions and shifts, and he was subsequently removed from the field. But the injuries to the Chargers wide receiver room is going to probably force him into action uh, on Sunday. So um, this is a guy who has all of the skills. Like he has everything you look for from the wide receiver position. He has size. He has speed. He has the contested catch ability. Um, and obviously, you know, one of the sons of one of the best wide receivers of all time, probably the best wide receiver of all time. So, you know, obviously that's up for argument. There's a couple of guys in there, but I think Jerry Rice is in that conversation every single time that you have it. So he has the lineage and he has the skill set. We'll see if he has the opportunity to go out there and make the most of it. Yeah, it'll be fine. I didn't even realize Jerry Rice had a son, so it's good to know. I, I Couple, guess yeah. More. I, he went to USC. I don't. I deal with the other <laughs> USC, right? Like the. I always Fair. tell so. So my wife is from South Carolina, so she always tells me, "Oh, that's they. they it's called USC over here." I'm like, "No, it's not." That's no. South Carolina. Exactly. It's USC is Southern California. And she always goes with the Darius Rucker line of like, hey, uh, South, South Carolina has been in college longer than California has been a state. But I, I don't count it. I don't count it. Either way, <laughs> we're heading back out to California. We, we spent the entire month of August in California since cool. that training camp there. Feels like we've, I mean, we had a preseason game against the Chargers last year. We faced the Rams at SoFi last year. So we're heading back out. It is a familiar track. So I feel comfortable. I don't know how comfortable the team feels on a five-game losing streak. Hopefully, they feel comfortable. How do you feel? What What is your kind of read on this game? How do you think the Chargers are going to come out in this game? Short week, that's never easy, and it's one of those doubled up. Saints are on 10 days rest and, and on top of that. So how, how are you feeling about this matchup coming off of that uh, loss to the Cardinals? Well, I think the Chargers have a bad taste in their mouth coming off of that game uh, where they shot themselves in the foot repeatedly. Like they, they should have beat the Cardinals by two scores. They, they, they throw a, a like a basically a touchdown pass to Jalen Rager and he fumbles inside the five yard line. It goes into the end zone. It's a touchback. They pick off Kyler Murray with a defensive lineman uh, and that defensive lineman gets stripped and the ball goes back to the Cardinals. The, the, the Chargers and have a rookie corner who gets an unnecessary roughness penalty at the end of the game that basically gifts 
the the Cardinals into you know field goal position to where they can go finish it and win the game. So if the Chargers do not kill themselves with these stupid, unnecessary penalties and not capitalizing when they do take the ball away, and why don't you freaking score a touchdown for crying out loud? They have not scored a touchdown in 15 straight drives. So it's been really, yeah, really, really bad. Um, in that aspect, they're not getting to the red zone. And when they do get to the red zone, they are not scoring touchdowns. So if the Chargers want to win this game, they have to run the ball. They have to dominate the line of scrimmage. And they need to score some freaking touchdowns if they want to win this game. And I know this is a defense where they're susceptible to the run. That doesn't mean anything. The Cardinals were one of the worst run defenses in the NFL, giving up 153 rushing yards a contest. They did not give up more than 80 rushing yards to the Chargers. So the Chargers have to run the ball if they want to win, and they got to score in the red zone. That's that's what it has to be for the Chargers if they want to win this game. Gotcha. You mentioned Jalen Rager. Is he on the, is he on the practice squad? Like, what's the deal? He was. That? Yeah, he, that's how bad it is. That's how bad it is for the Chargers wide receiver room that they're having to sign a guy off the street, put him on the practice squad, and elevate him basically in the matter of a few days. That's what we're working with with the, this Chargers wide receiver room. This is why I have pounded the table about them going and adding a weapon so that they can stay afloat in an AFC that is very much still up for grabs. Yeah, and a receiver that got cut by the Patriots, no less, because uh, he's yeah. posting the Maserati in the trailer park meme, right? Uh, it's not it's insane. <laughs> not even like not even like top of the barrel uh, uh, practice squad guy. No, not at all. They're taking a warm body at this point. Yeah, yeah, right. Hey, the Saints are in the same way. They just took the Bill scraps with Marquez Valdez Scantling and they're like, oh, let's see what he can do. Uh, but at least again, they're probably gonna get Chris Olave back. So at least have somebody to throw to who isn't a UDFA. Either sure. way, David Drogemeyer, host of Locked On Chargers. Thanks so much for hanging out. I know you're a busy guy. Uh, it's gonna be fun. Looking forward to the game this weekend. Appreciate it, man. Absolutely. Uh, and hey, if you guys want to look for my work, you can find me on Twitter at DrotalkSD. You can find my show on Twitter at Lockdown LAC. We're on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you get your con- your podcasts. We are all over the place and we do podcasts five days a week all year round. So if you want to know what's going on with the Chargers, please check us out. We'd very much appreciate it. The fighting former Drew Breezes. I dig it. <laughs> all right, man. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks again to David for coming on. And, and yeah, I think you look at this Chargers depth chart and it's like, you think, you think the wide receiver room in New Orleans is bleak, man. <laughs> Listen to this. Listen to this. Josh Palmer, Simi Fajoko, Brendan Rice. Those are your healthy wide receivers right now. Quentin Johnston didn't practice either the first two days of the week. So, you know, he's questionable at best. Lad McConkey. Limited, I believe. So, so like you're basically you're looking at Lad McConkey, maybe Quentin Johnson, a guy that everyone universally kind of calls a bust, and then oh yeah, maybe maybe DJ Chark, a guy who couldn't cut it on the Panthers, Jalen Rager, a guy who couldn't cut it on the Patriots. So we'll we'll see how that goes for them. But uh, the Saints are hoping that that they're going to come out of this with the with the stars in the wide receiver room, and and we'll see how that goes. And I think that's gonna that's gonna be the key, right? If you can if you can generate some offense, if you can hold on to the ball and keep that Chargers defense on the field more than you were able to do with the Chiefs, the Bucks, the Broncos, right? You cannot allow the Chargers to just establish the run, stay on the field the whole game. If you can keep them off the field, if you can, I, I can't believe I'm even saying this, stop the run, and I think you have a chance. But either way, thanks again, David Drogemeyer, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Great insight. And if you want to check out his work, like he said, uh, check out Locked On Chargers. And he also did a crossover episode with Ross Jackson for Locked On Saints. So that'll be a good way to get the uh, the dual insight there. But all right, we're going to wrap this segment up. We're going to come back. We're going to bring in Steve Geller this time. We're going to break down X factors for Week Eight: Saints two and five, Chargers three and three. Can we win a game? Can we just win one? Can we just win one game, please. One. Is that too much to ask? I don't think it is. All right. This is Inside Black and Gold. You haven't subscribed yet? What the hell are you doing? We'll be right back. (laughs) 
And we're back. One more segment to go here on Inside Black and Gold. And I'm going to bust burst the illusion for you right now. We're about it's about 12 hours after the time I recorded that last segment. <laughs> Recording this on Friday morning. We recorded that on Thursday evening. It's been a weird couple of days. Getting it, ready. It's the season. Yes. Getting ready for Saints Chargers. And I've brought in co-host Steve Geller. He just showed up. Three Boom, seconds. I'm here. I said show up. Uh, we're going to get ready for Saints Chargers. We're going to, because I got to get out of Dodge. The Saints are deciding to escape ahead of the Taylor Swift storm, <laughs> if you will. And and driving around town this morning, I can tell you that is the right call because oh, holy man. hell, I, I, I got to feel bad for anyone who's not going to that concert who lives in this city because it's going to be a freaking nightmare. Uh, the, the, the cult of Swift has descended. Just for perspective, like, you know, uh, like we only have one car. Claire takes the bus to work. So a lot of times she'll be like, hey, if you're driving to work, I'll buy you a coffee, right? So it's like, right. oh, that's always a good deal. Uh, and <laughs> that works. so there's a French truck that's like right down the block and it's off the greenway. And like normally we go there because there's never a line at, at seven in the morning, 730 in the morning, whenever we went, I think it might have been eight, whatever. Uh, we, we get there, we park. Not only is there just cars lining the block, there's a line out the door out onto the street and it's like what the hell is going on like why are these swifties up so early um yeah and then and then driving downtown i mean it's like it's not only like the number of people it's like everyone's driving like a crazy person um they put I, the, the have you seen the the friendship bracelet on the superdome yeah and I, I love the uh the twitter sphere got attacked it and they they said, uh, you know, uh, they knocked it and made fun of the Falcons with it. I was like, of course, Saints fans got to it. Oh, that's not the one I saw. The one I saw was Dennis sucks. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that was that. That was a uh, yeah. That was that was going to happen either way. But um, Have man, you, what what I laugh at? Um, I appreciate Poyja Street got paved, but whoever's painting lines, it looked like a three year old did it. I, I can't believe it. I don't know. All I know is like. People are gonna get mad, and I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm complaining. I'm not mad, but like y'all gotta realize these 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 fuckers are gonna show up and spend some money. Like exactly, this Welcome is to gonna make bank on this in the Super Bowl. You know, we'll have no excuse not to fix these dang streets. <laughs> we got, we're gonna have the money. <laughs> and, and the thing is, obviously, you you know, Jeff, it's not one night only. Back to back to back, she oh. is pumping it out here. Yeah, I, again, again, like I'm going to a city that's hosting the World Series. And, oh yeah, that's right. Enjoy that. I, I feel like it's going to be like the 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 energy level is going to be way 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 easier to manage. Although the traffic in LA is going to be a nightmare too. So it's not really it's not really getting. They're at least getting to the place they need to go. Right? They're not they're not really avoiding anything because there's like concerts. There's there's a Lakers game on Saturday. There's a World Series game. It's gonna like I'm not gonna I'm gonna have to avoid getting in Ubers in LA. It's gonna take like an hour to get anywhere. It's gonna cost ninety dollars. So either way. Uh, it's going to be a weird weekend. It's going to be a weird weekend. And as you can tell, again, it's by the light in this room. That's why I couldn't pretend that I was recording this right after the last one because it was dark and now it's light. Mm -hmm. um, but either way, we're getting ready for Saints Chargers. And so Steve kind of, I've talked a good, this podcast has been going on for a while already. I've given you a lot of my thoughts. So Steve, why don't you give me kind of your just basic, you know, knee jerk reaction on this game. Chargers are favored by seven going into yeah. this game. It's over. So I uh, was surprised the number was that high, honestly, because the Chargers, obviously, three and three, a better record, but they haven't been world beaters by far. Offense, not impressive whatsoever. You've got uh, an elite quarterback, I feel like, but obviously the weapons around him uh, just are not uh, very lacking in the receiving core. I even thought going into the year, I was surprised the lack of attention even to running back, although Dobbins has been pretty good for them, but there's not a lot of depth behind him, I know, due to some injuries. Uh, defense, that, that's definitely a scary part of this Chargers team. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the Saints O-line and Spencer Rattler are able to manage that because uh, definitely expecting a rough time there. We say it over and over again. Saints got to get the ground game going. The positive with that, I think, though, the huge positive, Taysom Hill, Cesar Ruiz, likely back in the mix. It, you know, they're both full upgraded to a full go at practice. And it was like this huge beaming grin on my face. It's like, yes, it's happening. Um, just, just really needed. And obviously when you see Chris Olave too, obviously it looks like he's getting out of the, uh, the concussion protocol, able to be a full go at the practice. 
and you're seeing these weapons in place that we just, you know, have been on the shelf for a while. And it's like, all right, the, the Saints are starting to restock that talent, get back to who they were in the early goings. And I'm hoping maybe some of that offensive output can return to. I know Derek Carr won't be around, but maybe this third step for this third star for Spencer Rattler, we can hopefully see even more growth in him because it hasn't it hasn't been fantastic and wonderful, like maybe Jaden Daniels start to a season, but you're seeing glimpses from the, the glimpses. That's another sports term I feel gets used as the tongue of flashes or glimpses. Uh, but you, you see uh, the makings. I think of a starting quarterback in the NFL, and I'm interested to see if he can continue to develop with some things. Obviously, the turnovers are the biggest thing for Spencer. You're seeing glimpses of glimpses, I think. Glimpses, is the, yeah, exactly. The You're seeing flashes of flashes. Um, <laughs> and but, yeah, we, we said it before. It's like he was hampered right from the start, obviously in a bad scenario. And just getting a little bit of those reinforcements back, it, it's got to be a huge positive for this team. So that's let's end this skid this week, man. Yeah, to this point, you've seen Spencer play with a different team than the Saints intended to have anybody play with. Like, it hasn't just been, right. hey, you have a backup quarterback. It's you have a backup team that's led by a backup quarterback. At least this week, to to an extent, to the, to the extent that you feel like it's going to be a fair assessment, you have a backup quarterback playing with the Saints, right? Yeah. Um, the, like the, biggest thing that, at- the biggest thing, though, too, is I mentioned, obviously, Dobbins, their, their main running back, but... You can't let whoever is just, you know, trampling all over you. There's got to be some tackles made up front on this D-line. Uh, the progression of Pete Werner, positive in that aspect, too. I think he can help out with this squad in the run-stuffing category. And I know he's been limited. Hopefully that hamstring issue isn't enough to keep him out of this matchup just because any kind of reinforcement there at the linebacker spot is way needed. I expect all those guys to play, right? I expect Taysom Hill, Chris Olave, Pete Werner, Cesar Ruiz, Lucas Patrick. I expect them all to play. And Pete Werner, I think, a big part of um, what Pete brings that's that's a little harder to see is the communication, like just the confidence level that he brings out there. Like we, I, I've seen more in the last couple of weeks than I have seen in years. Saints linebackers just completely out of position, just over and over again. Like again, like I mentioned, like. Demario Davis is being asked to make plays at the edges of the field way too much of the time. And a lot of that is like, okay, where's the guy who's supposed to be there? Like his zone does not extend sideline to sideline, <laughs> right? He's right. the middle linebacker. Um, and so you, like, I, I want to see other linebackers making plays at the edges of the field, but <clears throat> just for perspective on how crazy, like a seven point spread is here. The chargers are one of the worst offenses in the NFL in terms of putting up points. They've averaged 17.7 points this season. They haven't cracked 16 since week two. That's the team that the Vegas has given you seven points on. Like if if you and you can't just expect them to just put up like 28, 30. So you gotta be if you're making that bet, you're making that bet assuming that the Saints can't score at all, and and that's a right. fair bet. Folks, I've, a lot of folks went off the cliff complete, completely after that Thursday night debacle. Yeah, and I understand it. I understand it. And that Saints team that we saw on Thursday night and and frankly the Sunday before that from a defensive perspective didn't look like they'd beat anybody, at least outside of that yeah. second quarter, which you know, like feels like it was played in an alternate dimension from the last two weeks. Right? right. Like if, you, if you ignore that second quarter and you just look at the other seven quarters that got played in the last two weeks, the Saints have been outscored what? Like, I don't even know. I didn't even do I should have done the math, but I know they have yeah. 10 total points uh, in seven quarters and they've been outscored by... 24, 17, 33. So you're right. talking like 78 to, to 10 in the in the in the quarters that did not include that bizarre 27 point barrage by the Saints in that second quarter. So yeah, I mean, why would you assume that this offense is going to suddenly put up points, especially if you're a better? And, that, and that's the thing; it's seven points because the money is going on the Chargers. Yeah. I think this game opened closer, and it, and the, the line kind of went away from them, and. You know, that's if you're if you're the Saints and you're hopeful that hey that line is way off, it's because hey they're not banking on this kind of paradigm shift that can occur when you have a more functional offensive line when you can run the ball. You know, wow! According to ESPN, bet at least it opened at seven and a half. Did it? Shocking. So, okay, so the, okay, they never got any credit. So actually, it has no. come down a little bit. Yeah, because they're, they're like Taysom's limited. We'll give him a half a point. 
I, I, I would expect it to get closer as we get closer to the game. Once, once the news kind of comes out, like the Friday injury report, and a lot of these guys are either questionable or don't have an injury tag at all. Right. Uh, I would expect it to get closer. I think, you know, you're reacting to what you saw in that game. And even just getting Chris Olave back changes so much for this offense in terms of like you couldn't extend drives because no one was getting open. You couldn't throw the ball and you would. You oh, know, oh, you mean having one legitimate starting receiver that that's going to mean a lot? A little, bit. a little bit. Well, I mean, look at the Rams and Vikings last night. The Rams looked like a completely different team with Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua out there. I couldn't believe how seamlessly Puka was just back in the mix. I was like, okay, he doesn't need a game to warm up. Well, and like, and it's not even just like you look at the numbers and the numbers aren't incredible, but like you watch how the Rams closed out that game and it was Cooper Cup pick, picking up those key third downs at the end of the game. And that's what you need. That's why you have star receivers because you trust them not, you know, the numbers are great. Justin Jefferson had great numbers in that game. I want to say like, I, I, I didn't even look at the box score, but like I watched over my shoulder as I was recording that the podcast and yeah, uh, you know, like, but it's those, it's those critical catches. It's those third down conversions in the fourth quarter. That's eight where you need your starts to show up. Eight grabs, one fifteen. By the way, no touchdowns. But yeah, hell of a night. Right, like like Justin had the better game. <sighs> yeah, but Cooper was the one closing it out, um, and and so were the refs. <laughs> oh, they decided to feign blindness. Like I, I, maybe I, that my assumption is they they think that Sam Darnold is like half owl because they were like, oh, his head's facing backwards. That's just normal. It just does that. He just goes like. I'm sure you follow Ghetto Gronk. He's got some great material on it. Uh, just one of my favorite follows on social media. Ghetto Gronk, I highly recommend. This is me trying to be an owl. Ooh. And like, Ooh. do the... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. We've just kind of gone way off the rails. But okay, let's let's get into the matchup. Okay, so let's, yeah. do, let's do X Factors. Um, let's start on offense because... Because I said I want to talk a good bit about offense and the defense. We already, we know what the defense is. Uh, like uh, we, we've talked it to death. So let's talk about the offense. Like, what is your X factor on offense in this game? And we can do a couple. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I definitely want to say you know the run game as a whole, but to me, I I need to see. It's a third game now for Spencer Rattler, and I know it's going to be on the road, so it's not the friendly confines of being at home. But, but I I want to see a little more from him in the fact of. Uh, decision making, uh, being able to secure the football, and just you know the, the decisions he makes to go downfield. Uh, overall, just looking for improvement from him, and I think that as long as he can help sustain this offense, uh, along with the running game, obviously. But that this is a, a a winnable game against a team. You mentioned it; they they don't put up a ton of points, and I think you can uh, you can even field goal this team to death. Uh, it, it feels like. Uh, but you, you definitely have to be more efficient than that Thursday night game because it just nothing seemed like it worked. It just looked very disjointed and sloppy. Obviously, Chris Olave, Cesar Ruiz, um, and Taysom Hill back in the mix are, are going to boost that a ton. Yeah, and to me, you know, I'm going to be a little bit more specific, and it's like I need to avoid turnovers. If I can avoid turnovers, if I can win the field position battle, if I can put my defense in good positions – then I like my chances a lot better. Three of the last four games, the Saints have allowed a touchdown while their offense was on the field. Three out of the last four. The only one you didn't was in Kansas City. Against right. Atlanta, you actually allowed two touchdowns when your you defense was not on the field. Not winning football. When you are struggling to score points, that is the absolute last thing you could afford to do. Like Giving them I, away. I felt okay going into that Bucks matchup. I thought, hey, this is going to be a close game. This is going to be a defensive struggle. And then the first offensive drive, or maybe it was the second, I can't recall, the f like fumble for a touchdown, down seven to nothing, and it's like, oh, oh. this is over. Like it kind of it felt over to me. It felt like, okay, we're not we're not overcoming this. <laughs> like, and you know, it, it, the 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 fumble for a touchdown against the and it's funny because they've both been fumbles. Usually, you're talking about pick sixes. You don't see a lot of fumble sixes. But we've had two of them in the last two weeks, a fumble six. And now you could say that that one from Spencer was a pass, but it I think it technically went down as a fumble and he caught it in the air. So there was no question of whether it was a pass or a fumble either way. Like if you went back on review, maybe you would have, I think it might've gone backwards either way. Like you cannot in a game that, I mean, look at what, how it went for the Chargers on Monday against the Cardinals. Like they lost that game 17-15. 
in a game where you're talking about a team that averages 17 points per game, you cannot allow turnovers for touchdowns. And frankly, you can't allow turnovers in general, especially mm-hmm. ones that put them in plus territory. Like I consider a turnover for a touchdown incredibly damaging. And I'm also going to lump in like a turnover that sets the other team up in field goal range as the same category. Like in a game where you're talking about a team averaging 17 points a game, you cannot give them three points. You can't. You just can't. Um, and so I need the Saints to play a clean game on offense. You don't have to be perfect. You can punt. I'm okay with punts. As long as those punts are from like the 35 yard line or further. Like I want to be able to punt and pin them and force that Chargers offense with no weapons to have to go 90 yards. Because I don't think they're going to do it very often. Um, like we talk about, hey, this is a good rushing offense for the Chargers. I mean, they're like ranked 19th in the NFL, 18th in the NFL, right next to the Saints. So like they they, they run a lot. They're dedicated to the run, but they don't do it particularly well. Now we could talk about the defense a little more, but like this, you can win a field goal game here. Right. You could have won a field goal game against the Broncos if you did it right. <laughs> He didn't do it right. Um, so that's my X factor is like play a clean game and take advantage of your opportunities. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to be going downfield constantly, but I do need you to stretch the field. I do need you to get Chris Olave involved. Uh, and and if you can do that, then, then, then okay. If you can't, if you constantly turn the ball over, if we're giving up two to three turnovers a game, you're not going to win. No, and the, the, the whole vibe of the team right now, I know isn't, high the guys aren't the confidence level is down here but i there, there i can't even say there's a lot of football left but there's there's plenty of games and where you are in the division to still keep afloat but i think we we might have mentioned this i don't know if it was on camera or off but you lose this one and it is almost like you might as well put a fork in it mathematically it's not, it's not an nfc game though either so it's kind of like eh mathematically you could say like oh you could lose this game beat the panthers and still be alive emotionally speaking and i I don't know how many like you could say two and five starts like the odds of you getting to the playoffs are low but it happens reasonably often to the point that it's not like well this this never happens there's no way there's no way back two and six a six game losing streak i bet you can count on one hand the number of teams that went to the playoffs in the same year they had a six game losing streak over the past like two to three decades like exactly that doesn't happen playoff teams don't go on six game losing streaks and i don't care what your injury situation is you could be completely injured you should still be able to take one win out of a six game stretch this this gotta be that game right and because because here's the thing if you win this game and you face the panthers you should be able to win that game and you're back to four and five with a divisional game against the falcons where you could get back to 500 and kind of keep afloat in the NFC South, damage their chances in the process. The Bucks are hurt. Like, you have to start now. And there's nothing about this Chargers team other than a pretty stout defense right, that right. makes you feel like... That's why the seven-point spread is crazy. Like, I think that's reacting to the five-game losing streak and not, like, the relative quality of these two teams. And I do think the, the mood in the locker room, the vibe in the locker room, is not one of a team that feels defeated. It's one of a team that feels like, hey, we're going to get this figured out. You extended Alvin Kamara. You got these veteran leaders. They're not just going to roll over. With that point spread, it's like, oh, man, Peyton pulled their pants down on national television. So, yeah, that's stuck in everyone's crawl. Yeah, it's it's a point spread that believes that that's the loss that's going to completely demoralize the team for the rest of the season. And I understand why people would think that. I just don't think that's going to be what happens because I've seen this team do the same thing each of the last two years. Well, Every you know, time that they're kind of like at that the brink. They seem to turn around and, and and show some pride. And I expect them to do that again. Yeah. Um, you you mentioned that, that with the pride. And I think that's a thing, too. Perception is, oh, this team's quit on their coach. Yeah, right. And and we'll see. Maybe they have. Maybe they'll go out there and get boat raced by the Chargers. And if that's the case. Well, that says a lot, too. That right. says a lot. Right. I, I don't I don't buy that, but we'll, we'll find out. Nah. Um, one guy that I'm interested to see is, is Marquez Valdez Scantling. Uh, obviously, he's been here since Monday. I asked Clint Kubiak uh, on, on Thursday, you know, how difficult is that to show up? Uh, you know, uh, you know. What, first of all, what did you see from MBS? And and then, okay, what what? How difficult is that to show up midweek? Even a guy who understands the offense the way he does, having been in a similar offense with the the Packers and and Matt Lafleur, like how tough is that? This is what he said. Uh, yeah, he's he's a really bright guy. Um, enjoyed having him around in practice, and you know, we're trying to work him in, work him in a little bit of a time, and uh, he's done a great job in the meetings and and working his tail off to get up to speed with us. 
is it? I mean, how how difficult is it to pick up an offense in five days and expect someone to be out there? Obviously, has some familiarity with what McFlurry is yeah. doing up in Green Bay. But. Yeah, I think I think it's very difficult because it's verbiage aside, which he's really bright and played in a lot of different systems. It's it's you know the synergy with the quarterback and all the all the little nuances that go along with really nothing to do with learning a playbook. It's just the timing the timing that it takes in the pass game and the timing that it takes blocking the time on task that a lot of the other guys have had since April. Um, uh, but I will say that he's been impressive thus far and getting to, getting to know it pretty quick. So first of all, no cap Clint Kubiak because he's, he's not wearing a hat. That's how you know he's telling the truth. <laughs> Is that um, the first time this year? I, as far as I can remember, you know, it's funny. I didn't even, I was like, why does he look different? <laughs> he, he also shaved his beard. Like he was growing a beard for a while. And then he just decided I'm done with this. And, but like, I was like, he looks different. And I couldn't put my hand on it. And then I saw John Hendricks tweeted, he's not wearing a hat. I was like, that's what it is. It's like that one game that Trump ah. decided to not wear a visor. Uh, and I was like, oh, that's so yeah, right. Uh, who the hell is that guy? That guy. But no, it means he's, means he's, he's, he's locked in. <laughs> Whatever but, works, I'm in. But no, and, and so MVS, you know, again, I think I said this earlier in the week, like I expect him to play. I'd be surprised if he's inactive just because like who, who, like you need bodies. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cedric Wilson has been hurt. So if Cedric can't go, then that would make sense to have him active. And I think you would have a limited kind of menu of plays. You're not going to ask him to do a lot of complex things, but hey, it's not that complicated to say, okay, you know, the freaking run play, right? Like yeah. freaking run. Okay. Got it. Yeah, would yeah. would you rather be throwing to uh, MVS or Mason Tipton? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, <laughs> I haven't seen Mason Tipton take advantage of any of those opportunities. So, yeah, if if the question is, hey, who would I rather go out there and not catch a ball? It'd probably be MVS because <laughs> I think he's going to demand a little more attention. Um, just from name name alone, and yeah, he's bigger. He's six four, right? So, like, if you do need him to block, I like him better in that in that part of the equation. Uh, his hands are suspect, but you know, I think the, the question is, does he have a – do they feel like he has a decent enough chemistry with the quarterback, the timing, um, you know, what he, what the quarterback needs him to do, is he doing it? And and does he – is he reading things the same way as his quarterback? And if the answer is yes, then yeah, you throw him out there and you and you see what he can do in a limited uh, segment of plays. If he can't, then yeah, you probably go with Mason Tipton. Um, but this team likes him. He knows New Orleans well. I thought that was interesting. Like his dad's side of the family is from New Orleans, which explains a little bit about why – he might have been interested in coming here um, a couple of years ago. He said that that he visited the Chiefs and his next visit was going to be to New Orleans, but the Chiefs basically wouldn't let him leave. Like they were like, okay, what deal do we need to give you to keep you in the building? Worked out and for him. They had the deal, apparently. Um, yeah. So he never actually took that visit to the Saints, as far as I understand. But um, they got him a couple of years later. You know, he got two Super Bowl rings, so he's not mad about it. Uh, and and we'll see. You know, I do think he'll be a good addition if they can keep this season afloat. I think that he'll be a positive addition to this team in a way that you need without Rashid Shahid. So that's kind of an X factor, and, and it's not a big one, but it's like, hey, can MVS impact this game at all in any respect? And if he can, okay. I'm a little concerned if Buffalo is just willing to just toss him aside, really. Though, so that's kind of weary to me. Yeah, I mean, sometimes things just don't work out. Yeah, I hear that, right? right. Like, uh, but I'm, I'm hopeful too. Set. I'm not like totally, totally writing it off. It's just a little like, wow, Buffalo didn't think they could use him at all. Yeah, I mean, they, they got Amari Cooper, and you know, he was expendable, and yeah, maybe he asked to leave, right? Like sometimes it's like, hey, I don't want to be here. This isn't working out. Let's just let's just cut bait. Um, so maybe that's what happened. Maybe they said, hey, we can sign you to the practice squad and keep you around. And he was like, right, I'd rather right. go find another opportunity if I can. He's a no, veteran, so he didn't have to go through waivers. He got to just decide. Um, your your so, availability of guys right now and the opportunity, there, there's definitely a need right there. So I'm willing to try anything at this point, too, to get something going. Yeah, I, I think you're at the point in the season where there's a team out there that you are interested in playing for that has a desperate need for wide receivers. And, and, and you will fill that and you're not getting opportunities with the team you're on. So I, mean, I think yeah, it, that's yeah. probably a part of it is like the team just said, hey, you know, we're not going to play you. So we're gonna find a spot for you. Like we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna cut you and you're gonna figure it out and then take them off. Service. Yeah, right, right. I think that's the right thing for a team to do. You don't want to hold guys hostage if they don't want to be there. Um, now, and and it's not like he's like ring chasing. <laughs> he got his rings. He's won back to back rings. How many more rings? I mean, he doesn't have that many more fingers to put him up. Uh, but 
Yeah. He's got a reunion too with some of his former chief teammates. That's true. That's true. Um, okay, not not on offense though. The Saints do not typically go for Chiefs offensive plays. They go exclusively for the defense. But all right, one more guy. And I'm gonna I'm just gonna say kind of buy or sell here. Kendra Miller over 35 rushing yards. Oh what's buying? I am buying. I I'm need buying to buy. Too. I'm um, buying too. I, I think uh we saw some nice things, obviously, and with that kind of combination, I'm hoping they realize of Camara and Kendra, and plus now if Taysom's a go this week, which looks like it's going to be, that that makes me a lot more happier and hopeful going into the, to a game because you just have um, so many options at your disposal, and just seeing what Kendra's been able to do, uh, I think they can. Th there's been there's been the promise there uh, that he's shown, and. I'm hoping that whatever hamstring issue that nagged him forever is definitely in the rearview mirror because um, uh, an, an added fresh weapon too. And I think you saw that. It was kind of like, wow, this guy's got the, that punch about him. And yeah, well, he's been resting for a while. Yeah, and, and I'd like, to, I think the ideal scenario here is you you get this closer to not necessarily a timeshare, not a 50-50 split. No, no, but, right. I want to see scenarios where Kendra gets like a, the majority of a drive. Like unless he needs to come out for a blow, it's like okay, this is Kendra's drive, right? Like I don't, I don't want this to be Alvin is the ninety percent back and Kendra is the the change of pace second guess back. Like it's hey, this is Kendra's drive. Let's see what he's got. And you know, if he if he shits the bed, then he shits the bed. But I need to see that. Yeah. I need I need to take some of that because here's the thing. I think throughout the course of a game, you know, you're wearing like Alvin's dealing with injuries. You're committed to him now, so it's not a question of like, hey, or do you feel like this, he can get the job done? You you made the statement you feel like he can get the job done. It's not about that. It's about what gives you the best chance to get the A game out of both of those guys. Um, and I think giving Alvin a little bit more time throughout the course of a game to just kind of catch his breath on the sideline, that's going to be a positive for him. Amen. And so, you know, I, like I think if the Saints offense is going to be effective in this game, it's going to be because they run the ball. It's going to be because Kendra gets involved. It's going to be because, and this is going to be interesting to see, like how much do you run QB power with Rattler as opposed to Carr? I think you're probably a little bit more comfortable taking him off the field than maybe you would have been with Derek. But at the same time, we haven't seen him ever do that. So how does he react to that? How does he handle those situations? We'll find out. But yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Like, Kendra, whenever you've gotten him on the field, he's had a burst. He's had juice. Right. And I think there's a scenario where, hey, you just run the ball. You don't have to put the ball in Spencer Rattler's hands if you're running the ball. And when you're breaking off six, seven-yard runs on first down, it becomes a lot freaking easier to do that. And I don't Amazing. remember one time that happened uh, other than the one time Kendra did it <laughs> against, the, against the Broncos. <laughs> like, did that happen ever against the Chiefs, against the Broncos, or against the Bucks? Other than that one time, Kendra did it? No. You're in like second and eight, second and nine, second and 12. And I think last game, uh, I think it was eight touches he got. I would hopefully you can get into the double digits, 10 to 12, maybe this matchup. Yeah, I, I think that's a good number. And, and again, like, I would like to see him kind of get his own drives, his own yeah. series. Um, all right, let's shift over to defense. Again, like this is mostly going to be on offense because we know what the defense has to do. They have to not allow any of these, uh, I don't know, what do you want to even call these wide receivers? Because they're not wide receiver ones or twos. You need, you need to prevent any of these wide receiver four slash fives from beating you. Um, and then stop the run, right? The the run is obviously the biggest one that's scary because it, they've shown no ability, no matter which back it is. Or, you know, whether whether you are an NFL caliber player or not. The, who's the, I, I asked, uh, I asked, who the Sean Tucker is for this game. And yeah, David said it was Kamani Vidal. He will be the Sean Tucker if there's a Sean Tucker of this game. So stop Kamani Vidal. And, and I honestly, that's true. Like, like, or pick you know up in fantasy. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> they, you know what J.K. Dobbins is going to do, right? They're going to try to yeah. pound it down your throat and you're going to figure it out. Um, now, okay, how do you stop those kind of secondary runs? Because those are the ones that are from the most frustrating. Because it's like those are the ones where you get them in like a second and long, and they're still running it and still picking up seven or eight yards. And it's like that's the, not even a good running back. Tackle that guy. Um, so I mean, I think like, to me that's it. I need the defensive line to get some push. I need the linebackers to be in position 
to blow some things up. Um, and I'm hopeful that with Pete back, that does make a difference. Like, yeah. it's easy to say, like, an X man up, slot this guy in there, he'll do fine. You know, there's there's something to be said for chemistry. There's something to be said for knowing, okay, this guy's going to be in the right spot. I can play free because I know that guy's going to do his job right. And, you know, uh, Joe Wood said there has been instances over the last few weeks, he wouldn't name any particular ones, but there's been instances where, like, something got miscommunicated and the, and the defensive scheme was not run correctly. Right. And so you watch like, how, how does that guy get that wide open? How does how do you forget about this guy? How does this guy find a clear hole? How, how do you lose gap integrity by that much? Well, when you don't play the scheme correctly, that's what happens uh, is things get way easier for the offense and they're able to take advantage of it. So I'm hoping that with 10 days with Pete Warner back with, you know, obviously you're having some differences with Alante Taylor and Kool-Aid in terms of filling in for Paulson Debo, But I don't think that changes fundamentally what you're doing all that much they might try to pick on kool-aid when he's out there and that's going to be something to watch but at the end of the day we know the scheme works like it's not a scheme issue it's a it's an execution issue at least you're not worried either it's like oh at least uh none of the guys like a kool-aid or uh like you mentioned alante no one's gonna have to go against like a chris godwin or anything yeah this isn't the matchup that i'm necessarily worried about like, <laughs> right okay well how are they gonna guard this guy and, and no one's gonna have to go against the chris godwin for the rest of the year because he's out for the year it, we talk. You, you talk about this during the seasons too. Like it all depends on when you play an opponent. Imagine taking on Tampa now with no Mike Evans and Godwin. It's totally different. Feels a lot different, and I'm I'm fascinated to see what they do. Like right, you know, we if uh, you know we talk about hey, it's weekend. tough to win. It's tough to win when you when you're hurt, right? And now the Bucks have a situation where not only are they hurt, <laughs> they have a tough schedule coming up. Like, uh, you know, they you got, got the Atlanta this week. week. Yeah. So they, you know, they're both four and three. So one of those teams is going to come out of that with a with a one full game lead in the division, and then and then the the Bucks get Kansas City and then San Francisco, Rut row with with throwing to Trey Palmer and Sterling Shepard. <laughs> I mean, they're basically the Giants uh, of like two or three years ago. <laughs> and Sterling Shepard is a guy like he he can never stay healthy. Like that's been the story of his career. Like I remember him getting drafted out of Oklahoma. I'm like, I actually like this kid. He's pretty good. Yeah. And then, like he had like three devastating knee injuries in a row. I'm surprised he's still playing. And so yeah, and then they and then they get the Giants. Funny enough. So no, I mean like there's a there's a realistic scenario that you know they got three games to go into their bye week. They could lose all three of those games, and then suddenly the Bucks are the team staring at four and six, and the Saints. You know maybe they're at four and six. So like right, we we knew this division wasn't. There was no going to be no runaway ever. No, and the Falcons, you know, it's funny. You look at the Falcons, like the Falcons are primed to be that team. Like, yeah, right. They, they have everything working for them. They're healthy. Everyone else in the division is banged up. They have a reasonable schedule. Like, what, what is their schedule over the next three games? They obviously have the Bucks. Then they get the Cowboys, who don't seem like they can beat anybody. And then no. the Saints, and then the Broncos, right? So, like, you know, you're four and three. You win this week. You're five and three. You face the Cowboys, a team that doesn't seem like they can beat anybody. And you know, maybe you're six and three. Like they, if a team is gonna run away with this division, it's gonna be the Falcons. All the Saints can do is win the games ahead of them, hang a loss on the Falcons, and give yourself we'll get one game closer and then see what happens from there. You know, I'm I'm rooting for the Bucks this week. It's because, gonna pain me too, but I'm rooting for Baker and the Bucks too for sure. Yeah, because like I, I like and it, and it would be a bad look for the Saints because the Saints' big excuses we lost our receivers and we can't win. Well, the, if they find a way to win without theirs, like like that kind of deletes the excuse for the Saints. Although they at least have their quarterback, and but but at the same time, like I think the Bucks' long term outlook is rough, and I I think right. they're gonna have. I don't think they could beat the Chiefs. I don't think they can beat the Forty ers So I want the the Falcons to get losses hung on them now. So that's, you mentioned the Chiefs. I got so annoyed. It's like, of course, they get, oh, just DeAndre Hopkins falls into their lap. And I know he's not the same dude anymore, but come on. It's, I don't, I, I mean, that's what they do. I, I'm not, I don't think it changes anything functionally for them. Like, DeAndre is about three years past his, like, people want to look at this and be like, it's the Randy Moss trace, and it's not the Randy Moss trace. No, 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 not there. But it definitely is someone, a reliable target, at least Patrick knows he can go to. Oh, yeah. Like, it's, it's better than like Sky Moore, who I think is also on IR. Right. Like, it's it's wild that, you know, the Chiefs, they're, they're unbeaten, right? They haven't lost? Haven't lost still. They're the only unbeaten team left? Only ones. Uh, and 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 they have basically and – that, that's, and that's the difference between a team that feels like it can win every week and a team that feels like it's going to lose every week. Because the Chiefs have every excuse possible on offense to not go win games, and they're still going and winning all their games. 
And I think they have a really easy matchup this week. Credit, obviously, you've got the best player in the NFL in Patrick Mahomes, but also, man, a healthy offensive line's nice. Yeah, and they have, they have the Raiders this week, then the Bucks, so they they should get to eight. You know, I still like the Ravens. I still think the Ravens are gonna. This is their year. If if Lamar can stay healthy, they're gonna go win, go go to the Super Bowl and probably win it. Because I don't think that the I think that there's not a lot of good teams in the AFC. I think the NFC top to bottom is a better football conference, but the best team in the NFL is in the AFC, um, especially with the 49ers kind of falling off a cliff. The thing with the Chiefies, too, that worries me in general, just, you know, you look at it, it could be end up being Baltimore, Kansas City. That's what it seems like we're going to get colliding. But uh, the Ravens defense isn't terrible. But, man, the Chiefs is just that much better to me. I, I still don't think they can stop Lamar. I don't think anyone can stop Lamar. Lamar. If it's um, and, and no one can stop my fantasy team. I have never gone 7-0 and in fantasy before. And, like, I haven't got a single player hurt. Like, I have Jordan Mason. Like I have the guys who are filling in for the guys that are hurt. I have Kareem Hunt. I got, I have Amari Cooper. I have Devontae Adams. Like my team is getting better. I am yeah. the I have the most points scored in my league. And but the real key is I play good defense. And I don't mean that in the sense that I have a good defense. I mean that in the sense that I have the fewest points scored against me in the league. That's always I'm a bonus. Points, for I'm keeping points off the board. That's the key. And that, you know, that's a lot harder to do than you think because you have no control over it whatsoever. Hey, man, you'll take that luck for sure. That's nice. Seven and oh, well, baby. Like, a lot of times you'd be like, oh, well, you're just lucky. You have the lowest points scored against you in the league. Like, yes, but I also have the most points scored. Right. So I don't know if I'd be seven and oh, but I would still probably be like six and one, five and two. Either way, like, it's not even a good team. Like, one time, I'll, I'll, pull, I'll send you the screenshot of it. Like, it's a good team, but it's not like, oh, you got all these stars. It's like, oh, no, my guys are healthy, right? And I got Lamar. I was smart enough to take Lamar. That's that, obviously a big key for sure. And uh, if he gets hurt, not only will the Ravens' chances go to shit, so will mine. <laughs> all right. Let's wrap this pot up. Again, Saints just need to win. It's really not that any more complicated than that. Go fucking win a game. I am so exhausted about talking about losing. And a couple more losses, and we're going to have to stop talking about losing and start talking about next season. So either you do it or you don't. No I don't want to start doing mock drafts. God, no. God, no. Uh, although, if you're going to lose, might as well lose them all. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway. It's like, oh, you're ruining our top five pick. Anyway, all right. Who that? Thanks to everyone who listened. Thanks to everyone who came back for part two on the YouTubes. And obviously, if you listen to this entire thing on the podcast feed, it's a long one. Because one of the problems with breaking them up like this is I'm like, yeah, I can go a little longer on this because it's like we're only posting a half at a time, except then the full podcast version of it's like two hours long. It's the Marvel movie of podcast today. Right. Like like we this went way longer than we intended, but it's usually because like when we get to this point in a typical week, it's like the third segment of an hour long podcast. And we're like, oh, we got to get out of here. This is the only one we've recorded. So we ended up doing it like a full podcast. <laughs> anyway, uh, so either way, I don't, I don't know. People. I don't think people complain about free content. So enjoy LA. Get me some World Series swag. I, I'm I'm weighing whether I want to make a really bad financial decision and buy a ticket to that game. I saw a thousand dollars for standing room. Yeah. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Maybe I might Trump go to a Lakers game though. The Lakers are playing the Kings, and I kind of think that's going to work to my advantage because some everyone's going to be paying attention to the, right. the baseball game. And I'll be like, hey, who's going to the Lakers game? Me. Just apply for a World Series credential. I'll I'll apply for a credit card. <laughs> um, I'll apply for a World Series credit card and put the money on there and then pretend it never happened. How about that? There you go, right. Pay it off for the next 25 years. What could go with that, right? <laughs> kind of like the Saints salary cap. But I'm bunts. All right, that's it. That's it. Who dat? Go Saints. Thanks, y'all. See you later. Subscribe. <laughs> Who dat? Win a game.